Well, thanks for coming along tonight and thanks for those joining us on Zoom and, and later watching on, uh, on video um, or television. And it's great to have Ed Husick back at the Sydney Institute. He, he was here, I think, um, in 2005 as uh, a young person who hadn't quite made it in a state seat. And then he came back later on, uh, early last year, as someone who was a significant shadow minister in the opposition, and now he's here as a cabinet minister in the government. So he's been a good friend of the Sydney Institute, and it's great to have him here. Now, I'll, I'll introduce him very briefly. Um, Educated at the University of Western Sydney, member for Chifley since 2010. He was parliamentary secretary to the Prime Minister uh, and then various shadow ministries in opposition. And now since the election of the Albanese government, the Minister for um, Industry and Science. And um, the topic for tonight is building a secure future for Australia's suburbs. Ed Husek, you're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jared. Thank you, Jared. And I just want to begin by acknowledging we're on the land of the Gadigal and pay respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to anyone here. I think I just need to pick up on your point, Jared. We were all young 20 years ago. So, um, uh, but it has been a, uh, it always has been an honour to uh, be invited, to be allowed uh, to address the Sydney Institute. I've been grateful for the fact that uh, Jared and Anne have created a place to be able to test ideas and outline. Uh, policies and engage in respectful uh, public debate and uh, I wanted to I guess start by doing uh, two things that I suspect one doesn't necessarily always hear in these type of speeches one is I want to be able to tell you a family story uh, and I want to be able to tell a Western Sydney story now I was raised in uh, in Blacktown and Sydney's Western suburbs I went to school in Mitchell High in Sydney's Western suburbs I studied Western Sydney University uh, and I worked in the region I grew up in before my political career. And uh, since 2010, I've had the honour of being able to represent the seat of Chifley. Uh, and to the rest of Sydney, uh, I appreciate Western Sydney too often uh, seems to appear like a amorphous mass. Parramatta seems like it's a million miles away from the CBD or that it might be right next door to Penrith. Uh, just over the road from Blacktown, down the street from Liverpool, in Campbelltown, whereas the reality is Parramatta is 37 kilometres from Penrith and Blacktown is 44 kilometres from Campbelltown. And just to give you a sense of dimension, that's basically the distance of Manly from Cronulla. So while to other parts of Sydney it might be a homogenous out there zone, to me it's home and it's home to my 2.7 million neighbours contained within nearly a dozen federal electorates living in a diverse range of communities, suburbs, but all sharing a Western Sydney pride. Every part of my being lives and breathes in that part of Australia. I grew up in a single income family, dad, sole bre uh, breadwinner, a blue collar worker making wages from welding and often traveling to different corners of the country, uh, weeks and months at a time to find out, find work where he could. Um, there are a lot of things I remember about those days. I remember that it was a tough job for him. I remember dad coming home to be patched, his clothes being patched up from burns or uh, having to sport gauze over his eyes as a result of the same burns. So it was a tough job indeed, but it was a job that also brought a lot of satisfaction, uh, a sentiment shared by manufacturing workers. It's a satisfaction in a job well done. Satisfaction in physically seeing the fruits of their labours. Satisfaction knowing that somewhere, someone had their life made easier, better, richer, uh, by something that he and many of other manufacturing workers had done with their own two hands. And the places that Dad worked were ones that were the backbone of our community. I remember, like yesterday, visiting him when he worked at a company that was the proud product of other migrant families, Transfield, in Seven Hills. As a child, looking at colossal structures housing scores of metal workers, clocking on at, uh, at 6am, finishing at 4pm 4 uh, 4 before heading home to rest pretty weary bones. While I remember those things, I remember, also remember the darker side of factory work. For example, how often Dad would be out of work during economic cycles and then being back in work as booms and busts, busts messed with employment. The fragility of our economic system laid bare around a kitchen table. In my own career journey, I was one of the first wave of graduates to secure a degree at what was then known as the University of Western Sydney. Um, when I grew up there, there was very little expectation and very little opportunity that people like me would get a higher education. So it's enormously 
Uh, it's an enormously proud thing to be able to have earned the title first in family to be able to get into uni. And when Western Sydney Uni came along, it was a godsend because it wasn't just a place where people uh, who lived where I did could get higher education in our community. It was concrete validation. We could and should aim for university. Yet people growing up in our suburbs today like mine have still got diminished opportunity. The tyranny of distance too often still prevails in higher education. We still need to press for better to find ways to make it easier for suburban kids to get to uni. Build physical spaces for university study in one part of the suburbs uh, and then open up new avenues even closer to home from there. Which is why our government's recent investment in suburban university hubs matters because it puts them in easy reach of people in our outer suburbs, especially when we want more kids from low socioeconomic neighbourhoods to go on with their learning. And there's an urgency about this because 50% of the jobs in the future will require a university degree. So investing in universities equips young people for those roles in an investment and as an investment in their future wellbeing, especially as technology continues to reshape the nature of work here and abroad. And that certainly was a realisation that stuck with me from the time I represented communication workers as a union official in workplaces in suburbs like the one I grew up in, because technology could open up new work or consign to memory old roles. The key to healthy transitions, planning, giving people a chance to move with the times and have a say in their future employment. So I've made technology, frankly, a parliamentary obsession of mine because of the way new ideas can shape society for good or otherwise. Last week, for example, I had the opportunity to represent the country at the UK's Global AI Safety Summit uh, convened by the Sunak government. 27 governments represented alongside CEOs from all the major players in AI and civil society. And what we witnessed there is a fundamental shift in views about the role that governments should play in shaping the use of technology. Gone was the sense of inevitable tech scale and disruption and permissive approach to technology. Fundamentally, the views expressed at that summit have coalesced around the notion that you can assure, ensure appropriate safeguards and innovate, as opposed to seeing those two things being incompatible. Throughout the summit, protecting workers, creating new jobs, ensuring local cultures could survive and thrive, tackling disinformation, all topics brought up regularly. Technologies should lift up societies. They should work as well for the workers of our suburbs as our cities. And my background is why, frankly, I care so much about the suburbs, why I care so much about good jobs for people living out there. Suburbs like Blacktown, but also Werribee in Melbourne, Elizabeth in Adelaide, Logan, outside of Brisbane or Clarkson in Perth. These are personal experiences, but they're not the only reason I care about Australia's suburbs and the people that live in them. Because we know that many uh, people out here suffer from greater socioeconomic disadvantage than other areas of our major cities. Worse health outcomes, worse unemployment, tyranny of distance. As a recent Deloitte study pointed out, every day some 300,000 people in Western Sydney leave home for jobs in the east, uh, in our city stuck with outdated infrastructure that hasn't kept pace with past growth. And while uh, educational attainment is rising rapidly in the West, many of the jobs on offer don't match the skills of Western Sydney's inhabitants. For example, I've got constituents who often approach me at my mobile offices telling me that their line of work only exists in the CBD, not in the suburbs, but they can't afford living in the inner city and are forced to contend with chewing up large parts of their day travelling to and from work, road or rail. The same story across our outer suburbs, across our entire nation. And these are stories that we as a government are working hard to turn around, to create jobs, build homes in places where people want to live. And in my patch as industry minister, there are things we are doing because there are a lot of bright patches. Our outer suburbs and regions where the bulk <coughs> of man manufacturing jobs are will also see continued growth. Importantly, our manufacturing jobs will be the ones that help us meet some of the biggest challenge, challenges we face as a nation, principally the transition to net zero. And increasingly, manufacturing jobs will provide sophisticated employment. Now, since 2022, I've been Australia's Industry and Science Minister, and I bring to that role my experience 
from living out in my region. Formative experiences that I've outlined uh, earlier have shaped how I think about my role as Minister. For me, this is not a job, it's something personal. Underpinned by a belief in the positive role of government, working with industry, academia and others, because industry policy is jobs policy. That's why we need governments that lean in and help rather than stand back and wish. Time after time, successful industries around the world have been built by the ingenuity of their founders, the hard work, skill of workers, the patience of investors, by governments willing to step in and do what they can to create and support the ecosystems that businesses need to succeed and thrive. And I've watched this for years, here and overseas. Our industry policy framework has been recast and modernised, giving it purpose, attaching to it national challenge, especially the challenge of net zero. The Prime Minister has often said he wants to see a future made in Australia, and the portfolios of science and industry have been deliberately joined up, making new discoveries that could lead to making new products right here in our country. And for me, that means a future also made in our suburbs and regions, because it's in the suburbs and regions that the jobs which will transform uh, econo our, our economic future will reside. But there's a task ahead for us to reach that future because over the last decade alone, national manufacturing outputs declined. Uh, we've got the highest dependency on manufactured imports and lowest level of manufacturing self-sufficiency. And over 30 years, we've seen our nation fall in the economic complexity order or index. Manufacturing jobs are good jobs. They're secure jobs. They're well-paying jobs. But as Australia's fallen in economic complexity, we've seen opportunities in jobs like this dry up. We've seen some of the opportunities for those Australians who want to work and build better lives for their families disappear. The countries that occupy the top spots on the economic complexity index have taken a different path to Australia. They're, they're, they are the countries that actively focus on industry growth, not by what's derisively called picking winners, but by creating the conditions in which winners can compete. After a decade of neglect and hostility, Australian manufacturing finally has a government that believes in it, that supports in it, that wants to see it grow and prosper because it's important for longer term economic growth and prosperity. And countries that have got their act together in this space, revitalising manufacturing, reap a dividend. So there are so many reasons to invest in manufacturing, the pressing need, no less, to reach a net zero future, the lessons we've learned in the pandemic and the over concentration of uh, on global supply chains that just aren't working the way we want them to. And as the Amer American think tank, the Brookings Institutions argued, manufacturing will be important because it provides high wage, jo high wage jobs, commercial innovation, and a disproportionately large contribution to environmental sustainability. And we can do this. We can help grow our manufacturing capability. Our suburbs have always been the heart of manufacturing industries and they've also been the home to some of our great manufacturing success stories. For example, 1948, Australian multinational card box manufacturer uh, was born with a £1,000 loan from Richard Pratt's aunt, Ida Visbord. Modest beginnings, but by, 90, by the 1970s, Visi had manufacturing plants in Warwick Farm on the outskirts of Sydney and in Victoria and Queensland. Uh, it had also become one of the largest employers in the regional communities of Tumut in New South Wales and Wodonga in Victoria. Now, I probably don't need to tell you the heights to which Visi has risen, but last month I uh, joined in the opening of their most recent factory in the suburbs of Brisbane. Uh, and the change in the condition of the factory floor when compared to, say, something that my, my dad would have worked in was stark. Automated vehicles, automated conveyor belts moving at warp speed, testament to rapid technological advances while also providing employment opportunity to produce one million boxes a day, which is just astounding. Um, a brand new Blue Scope steel factory opening in Western Sydney is replacing its old one and is going to produce 240,000 new colour bond steel rooftops per year or 80,000 new steel house frames. Uh, that's going to boost domestic manufacturing jobs, help people who live in our area get those jobs and at the same time provide much needed housing for those in the suburbs and around the country. Or you could look at Australasian Fresh in Western Melbourne exporting dumplings to Hong Kong. 
Republic of Korea, Malaysia, Singapore, or Vaxis in Brisbane that's found a way to manufacture needle-free vaccines that can be stored in a wide bandwidth of temperatures and is breaking ground right here in this country. That's what a Labor-led government is about, growing the factories of the past into advanced manufacturing centres of excellence. So I know we've got the strengths to do this and it's why we are determined to back these and other companies like them who are pursuing a future made in this country through our National Reconstruction Fund, industry growth program, and soon to be released things like the National Battery Strategy, which will value add and lever off our huge store of critical minerals. And we want to be able to back the industries of today, but also see transformation into the industries of tomorrow. Our factories look different to the past. They're safer, cleaner, greener, and provide still provide secure jobs. Um, the place that makes things here in Australia, the places that are, they're rapidly changing too. They'll, there will always be a place in Australia for women and men who want to make things. Jobs for people who are good with their hands, but will need assembly line workers, production hands, machine operators working on ever more sophisticated machinery. But there are new jobs emerging that require more advanced digital skills. And the government wants the men and women in our suburbs, our outer city suburbs, to consider it. Heading, heading off to TAFE to get skilled up for these jobs. That's why last month I was pleased our government announced a five billion investment from Microsoft into our economy. Next year, for example, as a result of that deal, a new Microsoft Data Centre Academy will open up in Western Sydney in partnership with TAFE. It'll teach crucial data and cloud skills we're hoping to get to people who might not previously have considered a tech job. You see, we want to skill up the digital tradies of the future. And our government's committed to a target of 1.2 million tech jobs in this country. But the real growth area for these jobs isn't in the tech sector per se, it's in techie jobs that exist in businesses across industry, like manufacturing and other sectors. It's why the government's heavily investing in TAFE, fee-free TAFE, because we want Australians to know that if they want to pursue further training, that they're not going to be encumbered by a financial burden as a result of doing that. We want to make sure that the folks in the outer suburbs of our major cities have got the right skills to access a growing set of jobs in industry and manufacturing that will last into the long term. It is absolutely no exaggeration to say the transition to net zero is critical for our future, critical for our environment clearly, critical for our economy, critical for our way of life. We are trying to fashion a new energy system and doing it in one generation compared to what previously took generations to achieve. It's a big job, one that can create a lot of jobs in the process. We need to mobilise Australian industry in this effort. And in meeting our national challenge, we can create new industries, capabilities and jobs in our suburbs and regions. The demand for things like steel, aluminium, fertilisers, cement, and so many of the products we take for granted and that you would never expect I talk about at a Sydney Institute speech, will be there in the future. Uh, we need to ensure these industries can still make great products while reducing their carbon emissions. For some industries, the pathway is clear, but for others, the work's still ongoing to identify the path to net zero, and it isn't gonna be easy. But what, we need, what will be needed is government and industry working together, putting their shoulder to the wheel to help identify those pathways because there are new opportunities to grow our industrial contribution to the global effort to reach net zero. We stand on the brink of seismic change, of new nation building, of global transformation of our energy systems, of new technologies like artificial intelligence and quantum computing, which will define this century like cars and personal computers did in the last. And of a post-pandemic world that recognises our supply chains are not as strong as they need to be. And to meet these transitions, we will need to create secure, well-paid work in growing in growing number of industries, not just a job to support a family, uh, but to be able to buy a home and enjoy the best our country has to offer. It's also about a sense of pride of making things in this country, using our know-how uh, combined with our great store of resources. Uh, in growing up in my region, factories doing just that were a lifeblood for countless numbers of families, but the factories of the future won't look like the ones we've seen in times past. 
I wasn't the only one uh, person, however, to do a double take hearing our political opponents claim that the modern Liberal Party is, is all about the Australian worker, about families, about people in suburbs and regional towns. Well, tell that to suburbs that the Liberals let down through their decades of long neglect of Australian manufacturing. Outside of politics built industry, coalition would close sections of it. The, the other side of politics chased the car industry out of the country. An industry Ben Shifley created, Bob Hawke expanded. Every Labor member of parliament feels viscerally in their bones that the closure of our car manufacturing, auto manufacturing sector in this country, um, the callous disregard, the hubristic taunting, the lack of foresight, diminished capability that didn't just uh, end in one year, but was felt through years after. We don't want to be import, just importing skills, jobs and products. Uh, we want to be able to make them here. The jobs, the products, the opportunity. Uh, and in opposition, <coughs> and in an opposition, uh, the coalition have systematically voted against things like, that would help manufacturing, uh, our energy price relief, our gas and energy price caps that not only deliver cheaper prices for consumers, but help lower the co input costs for manufacturing. They voted against many of the cost of living measures I previously outlined. They voted no to our investments to grow manufacturing. This type of approach will have a negative impact on the people who live in our suburbs and regions. But I think this moment demands more than the negativity of others. If we shrink from the moment, as some would have us do, we'll have blown a great chance to set up our country for the next generation and beyond. The chance to give working families of tomorrow what families had in the past, a secure future tied to well-paid jobs in growing sectors, and a sense of pride at seeing our know-how being put to use here or overseas. For Labor, where you live is where you grow, and that's all at the heart of the way our government approaches decision-making, with the suburbs not just places to live, but places to grow, to raise families comfortably, places to educate, right from kindy to uni and everything in between. Places with strong healthcare, with GPs, local medical centres, world-class hospitals. Places with real employment, career opportunities that don't require a 30-minute 30, 30 each way commute every single working day. Everyone in this country deserves to live in meaningful, secure lives with affordable childcare, access to quality education, local jobs. Because when you build those local jobs, you build local communities and you build a better future for the entirety of our nation. Thank you. Well, many thanks to uh, Ed Herzig for a very interesting presentation. So we'll come to questions and discussion. I said we usually take them broadly on the topic. Uh, so I'll lead off um, broadly on the topic. So you, um, <laughs> you, you made the point that um, you're not in the business of picking winners, but of creating an environment in which winners can thrive. But the example you give is uh, of um, Richard Pratt getting $1,000 or £1,000 from his aunt. But Pratt never got much government assistance, did he? I mean, essentially, and he went into the suburbs, as you say, and he went into the rural centres throughout Australia, and his, his son is still doing the same thing. But uh, paper products weren't protected. I mean, mm. it wasn't, wasn't a protected industry. It was sort of a, a... He once said to me, it was a great industry because people gave you all the stuff and, for free mm. and then you turned it into something else. That's what he said to me once. So to what extent um, do, do governments have to, have to play a role here? Mm -hmm. You come back here. And, yeah. Thank you. Um, so I guess I'd answer that in a number of ways. The most uh, obvious being we're setting up this thing called a National Reconstruction Fund. It's $15 billion uh, that will be uh, determined, the decision, investment decisions will be determined by an independent board. We're targeting a number of areas. When you ask me the question about, uh, in terms of picking winners, what we identified through the course of the pandemic, plus some of the other challenges we're facing in terms of transition to net zero, and also the geopolitical environment in which we operate, where our supply chain's too concentrated or broken, um, living through those events said to us, we need to focus on some key areas. So we're not doing everything, we're doing the important things that'll be vital to us longer term. So the value add in resources, what we do around agriculture, 
um, medical science, being able to manufacture more of our medicines here and back that type of innovation. Um, enabling capabilities, the technologies that we see will be important from AI, robotics, quantum, seeing what we can, we can do with that right here. Defence, transport, uh, and clearly the transition to net zero. So to your question when you said, uh, when you mentioned uh, Richard didn't get any uh, assistance as such, what we have found for people that want to expand their capability and in the environment in particular, uh, especially after the Omicron wave of uh, what we experienced through the pandemic, where it got harder to find money, but we know we've got this pressing need to build capabilities in the areas I mentioned to you all, we want to make sure that we can team up with superannuation, venture capital, private equity, and for manufacturers that want to grow capability in those priority areas, we want to be able to provide either those loans, guarantees or equity to grow their businesses and grow jobs. And in the process, attend to those things that I, I said. So uh, we also took advice uh, as well, Jared, uh, from in particular, uh, the CSIRO that looked at longer term what would be important, being able to lever off uh, our science and technology know-how and transform that into an industry capacity that we also realise will be vital for us longer term. And so we've been guided in that way to set that fund up. Uh, and it won't be the case that everyone, and I'm sure there'll be people who approach the reconstruction fund, don't get a loan or don't get a, some sort of support back and get very upset about it. But we don't want to have people like me, politicians with colour-coded spreadsheets making political decisions on the investment needed longer term. You need to all have confidence that there will be a rate of return when people uh, approach the NRF for support. Um, and that that rate of return is an indicator of two things. One, it's likely to be successful. And two, we can use that money to keep that fund going on and helping other businesses as well. So it's very thought through uh, to be able to give you all the confidence that taxpayer funds are being used well, but that they're being invested in, our, in terms of our economic future uh, likewise. And who will be on this board? So we announced uh, that, I'm going to say, in late June. It's headed up by a person called Martine Wilder, who's ex-Clean Energy Financing Corporation. Uh, it's made up of a range of people with different backgrounds, different sectoral backgrounds as well. Uh, and there are about nine people on that board representing uh, industry and work, workforce, because we think having a collaborative approach uh, is important. And so we've got, got that range of skills and expertise to help guide the decisions. Um, hi, that's very refreshing. Our immigration numbers are taking off again. Mm -hmm. uh, in the past, the long distance past, your father would remember, yep. our immigration took in manufacturing and they were very, it was very important. Mm -hmm. Are we going to use immigration in the same way, maybe for investment, for workers? Are we look at, is the immigration intake going to reflect some mm -hmm. of the needs of this sort of scheme? Um, so there are a number of things, Anne. Uh, we we recognise coming out of the pandemic the pressures that were on the economy and particularly in what was driving inflation um, because of the fact that our supply chains weren't working and a big part of that was employers couldn't find the people that they needed to fill those jobs. And it's across a range of different sectors. Uh, and so what we want to do is, is two things. We want to be able to build up our local base of people who can go in and fill those roles. And that's why things like, for example, um, fee-free TAFE, people who might want to do a career change but need the training to go into those high demand uh, jobs, that they can do them and do them well and do them for the long term. Uh, and the other education investments that we're, we're making, and I don't need to go through a shopping list of those with everyone here tonight. But that takes time, clearly, investing in that development of skills. So where we can get talent from other parts of the world to help meet the needs of industry is really important. And I've expressed the view, either internally or externally, we can't have businesses just um, wither because they can't find people to perform the work. And so we need to be pragmatic about what we're doing. So a lot of what we are trying to do in our immigration system is meet that need, bring people in that can um, help meet the jobs uh, that are required, which is, for a lot of you, um, it may sound extraordinary because it's been... I think well beyond anyone's memory where we've lived through a period of unemployment with just a three in front of it. So we've got a market where we need to find, we, well, we have got close to full employment as what, or we've surpassed the traditional 
boundaries of it um, or definitions of, of full employment, but there's still a need for talent. And the other thing, if I may say very directly and frankly, um, I, I want our immigration system, even if we filled every single job with someone locally, I'd still want us to have the flexibility to bring people in because um, uh, manufacturing and other, other jobs, uh, they rely a lot on new ways of getting things done. Our productivity, which we've got to work hard on improving, will require us refashioning processes and getting things done smarter. And if someone is doing that in some other part of the planet, we need to keep building our knowledge base. So we're trying to do the right thing both ways, train up locally, but bring in talent, ultimately fulfilling, um, making sure that fulfilling jobs are filled with people and that they're not waiting for people or, or going out of business because they just can't get the job done themselves. Thank you, Minister. Um, you mentioned lots of things, but you never mentioned the IRA, the Inflation mm -hmm. Reduction Act, and its impact that on the global capital markets and investment into the areas that you've outlined. Is the NRF the only response, or does, do you think that there are other things that we need to do in this country to, ch to meet the challenge of the IRA? I deliberately didn't mention it was my secret plan. <laughs> um, uh, no, it wasn't. Uh, we're very conscious, I might say, uh, about the impact that that's having, as a lot of countries are. Um, from our point of view, we recognise it's both uh, opportunity and risk. The risk clearly is that um, our capabilities get lured offshore at a time we need them to stay here, because I'm a firm believer we need to mobilise Australian industry to make the products required to get us to the 82% uh, you know, gener uh, energy generated by renewables, um, that we can fulfil the, the commitments we made to the Australian public, but more importantly, do what's right for the next generation. Um, there are a number of mechanisms that we have got uh, currently. Uh, either NRF has got that three billion target fund within it to help manufacture more of the technologies required for the transition. We also have clearly the, the um, Clean Energy Financing Corporation and ARENA. But that's not, the, that's not it. That's not the full um, package of what needs to be done. So, for instance, in my area, I've been working hard to ensure that we go that next step in, our, in the battery value chain. We do a lot of mining and refining. We don't do anywhere near the processing or the cell manufacture or the software and systems integration or the recycling and reuse of batteries, which will be the big issue for batteries long term. Um, and the other thing is, too, we are very dependent naturally on lithium ion, but there are a range of other battery chemistries that need to emerge as well. So we're looking now at, well, how do we invest to go to be able to go deeper into that value chain, potentially create over sixty thousand dollars, I think sixty thousand jobs, I should say, uh, and a huge impact on uh, uh, gross value add as well to the economy. And so we're looking at things like that. We've had the hydrogen head start program announced by my colleague Chris Bowen and there are other things we need to do. Most recently um, the Minister for Resources announced the extension of the critical minerals financing facility to be able to provide uh, further support uh, in that area but there's a lot more we can do. I mean we have huge reserve like if you look at the exposure of this continent to solar radiation and the fact that we don't produce solar panels though we were instrumental in the development of the IP, of the technology itself, right down the road uh, at UNSW, um, we can do more. And so, for instance, and I, I might loop back, if you don't mind, to something that Jared asked me earlier. You know, being able to print solar panels using ink that can transmit electricity is what is being tested at the University of Newcastle in a spin in a spin off or a spin out um, that is commercialising that technology with the ability to print that very quickly at way lower cost um, and while it will be replaced a lot quicker than traditional solar panels, um, has just as much, just the same efficiency but produced way cheaper, which means we can go from um, uh, having about roughly, I think off the top of my head, 25% of homes in this country have solar panels. We could do that way more and extend our lead as a country that's got the highest rate of rooftop solar in the in the uh, in the world, so there is a lot we can do, um, and we'll be progressively announcing some of these things. You'll see, and and we flagged 
that we need to do that so that we can meet those overall targets. Uh, thank you, Minister. Um, just from, from as, as you see it, how do we ensure that the new industries we're hoping to facilitate can be can, can compete internationally mm -hmm. whilst ensuring we maintain fair wages and conditions yeah. for employees? So um, that is a really good question. It's one that's uh, confronted manufacturing for the decades before because what we were competing with is processes where the labour component was way cheaper elsewhere uh, than what we were accustomed to and we don't make any apology, for example, getting people um, good wages and conditions and it goes to the heart of why my party exists, right? But the way that uh, things are transforming, um, I might come back quickly to, to, uh, to batteries, if you look at the type of labour that's required in the deeper parts of the value chain, the skills requirements are way higher. And if you look at the um, way in which people are remunerated for those skills, it's internationally comparable. And so what we need to see in terms of, and the way that manufacturing is going is it's becoming a lot more advanced. It's using a lot more robotics and automation, um, which is a, a point at which I can mention that we are developing the country's first robotics and automation strategy. Not because I want the Terminator to take over, but the reality is advanced manufacturing will require that degree of complexity. And we've got this great lot of skills here in robotics that we need to apply for the building of processes that can be used by manufacturers, like, for example, the ones I see up on the Central Coast, who have automated more and increased their workforce. So, so the, the game has fundamentally changed. And the reason why um, I talk so much about manufacturing is not to be a bore at parties, but rather to say it is a big deal for the country making things. And a lot of people love that idea that we are a country that can make things that matter to us. And importantly, um, longer term, uh, everything that the sort of industry conditions both here and overseas have transformed so much that we now have this opening that wasn't present decades before and we determined to seize that, that opportunity and make sure that it leads to the type of work that we won't be priced out of from other countries. Thank you, Minister. Give me the opportunity to ask a question. Um, my question is about the um, uh, Australia uh, uh, export a lot of coal to China. And the reason uh, China buy a lot of coal is not uh, necessary for electricity because China is the largest silicon uh, manufacturer and uh, you need a very high quality coal to um, uh, to produce very high grade mm -hmm. silicon which is for um, a semiconductor and a solar panel but the reason but it's very difficult to start uh, manufacturing uh, silicon in Australia because the net zero policy so is your government very uh, can be very uh, flexible to uh, to for in that case, because it can create a lot of employments. Thank you. Um, so I'm not trying to be deliberately difficult, but I think we probably have a different view on why it's harder to produce silicon here. And it's certainly not the case that a capability, for example, uh, in China that's been built up over quite some time um, uh, has happened in a way that there's been significant investment. In fact, there's a lot that can be learnt from uh, if you look at the lead that China has in a number of areas, a lot of it has come off the back of significant investment, not the least of which has been in R&D. And so I think there are a number of processes that play out. Um, but I take your point on board because the other important thing in terms of coal is it's not just for thermal but metallurgical, and it's got a whole stack of other, other purposes as well. And it's important that we understand that while we make the transition to net zero, there will still be things we need to use coal for <coughs> and gas for. And I've made these points publicly and I might just reinforce some of them here. Um, not the least of which with gas is it's an important feedstock, for example, in a product that we use uh, very in very great amounts every day, plastics. Um, and there aren't uh, alternatives that are available um, where we are using fossil fuels as part of that, that process. So there'll be other things where we don't necessarily need to use fossil fuels for energy generation. Um, where it's not a part of the direct production process. Uh, but, you know, things, for example, like green iron or green steel, 
um, that can use hydrogen uh, as part of that, that process, that that will transform that industry. And because um, steel, iron and uh, aluminium also feature in so much of the renewable energy equipment that we're chasing, we need to be able to find a way to produce that while not seeing the emissions footprint widen out. Um, so getting the balance right uh, is important. There'll be people that say we need, we can't move away from coal and gas at all, and there'll be others who say we need to shut it down right away. Um, I don't think either end of the spectrum is helpful or productive. There is a balance here, and the world is trying to find a way uh, to do that. I've got a question on Zoom from one of our young members up, up in, um, ba in Bathurst, mm -hmm. Chifley country, right? Yes. Yeah. And uh, she says <laughs> that she watched... So goes to Ben Chifley asking me a question from Bathurst yeah. via Zoom. She, she says that she, she watched Q&A last, um, last Monday and there was a woman on the program, yes, yeah, on the um, panel, yep. who said that um, if, if AI goes the way it's going, the world will end by the end of the century and she's only 23. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got any hope? Well, I, I try not to make my addresses to the Sydney Institute that morose, so I'm not going <laughs> to focus on it. There is a lot. Uh, look, we've been on a bit of a journey. I'll, I'll address the, the question at its heart, but we, I think it's important to note we've been on a bit of a journey. Um, if you look at the way we um, viewed technology, uh, particularly from the point at which a guy in a skivvy held up this thing that was called an iPhone, and suggested that it would be cool for a, a phone to have a camera on it and it would do all these things which people thought, why would you want a camera on your phone? Um, uh, we went from, wow, technology could really change the way we live our lives and we should just go full bore, just make sure we do everything when it comes to technology. We've gone from that utopic vision to one where there are elements, uh, as per the question that you've just asked, that question whether or not we'll even survive that tech ride that we've been on. Um, the, the question uh, around uh, the safe use of AI, that went to the heart of that summit that I attended last week in, uh, in London, where you had governments represented and some of the biggest companies. Um, and uh, the view was we needed to do something and we needed to do, when I say there's been a seismic shift, we've gone from governments that have said, you know what, you can self-regulate you know, go ahead, we understand there'll be disruption, but ultimately it'll be good for society, to some of the biggest AI companies on the planet telling world leaders, you need to do something about it because we won't. Not because they don't want to, but the accountability is different. They report to shareholders and they've got their lines in which they need to get stuff done. Government's accountable for shareholders plus wider community. And so getting it right's important. So what we're trying to do is ensure that there'll be different across different governments with different perspectives, we'll do better on safety testing. That is, before something is released, that um, in the design, the development, the application of AI, that the people that are doing all that can show that there's no unintended consequence, that in the outcomes from what's produced, um, uh, uh, that the, you can also evaluate that and that we can get that right. And what we're also trying to do is chart a pathway. There are things that often say you can't innovate if you regulate. Well, in actual fact, it's been the case that some of the greatest innovations have been in heavily regulated markets. And if you don't believe that, we wouldn't be taking the medicines that we do. And yet we see always a new breakthrough, a new medicine, and we, de we developed a vaccine in the middle of a pandemic, something that would take decades, got developed in, in just a few years, um, and that happened in a very heavily regulated market. We're not trying to stifle innovation. We want to give people confidence that the technology they're using is, is doing the things that people expect um, uh, and that we can get the full benefit of using that technology in that way and to make sure that um, in particular, and I, I get, I mean, I joked around about it, but we want to give, we don't want people to feel like that their futures will be um, crimped or, or that they won't have a future because technology is often a runaway tear and no one's doing anything about it, when really what we saw in the last week is a serious determination to get that balance right. Can you go down here? There are a lot of questions, so we've got to be brief. Uh, you've talked a lot about shoveling out billions of dollars of taxpayer funds and borrowed funds. W what is the government doing to make business 
uh, easier and to enable these new manufacturing facilities that you talk about. And I think about it in the context of Microsoft uh, wanting to build all these data centres where it's almost impossible for data centre operators to get planning approval to make data centres. Now, I understand planning approval is not your department, mm -hmm. uh, your jurisdiction. At this point, can I say thank you? Yeah, the, the, the question is, what are you doing besides shoveling out money to make it easier for business to set up these industries of the future? Well, I, I mean, I, I don't agree with the characterisation with shoveling it out. I think I've gone a great length to say that what we want to do is make the capital available so people don't feel like they have to do something that we is all irksome and irritating to us, which is businesses going offshore because the money wasn't available for them to pursue their ideas here and to build great businesses. And in doing that investment, we want to make sure that we make the investment right. It's not politically motivated, but it's done in a way that you can, and everyone here and anyone watching, can have confidence that proper commercial decisions are made. Um, on data centres, and I mean, I am grateful, jokes aside, that you've indicated that I don't necessarily have the, the planning power, uh, but clearly data centres and the fact that they house the con cloud computing that is vital for so many businesses and, and consumers, frankly, a lot of the products we use off a smartphone use data that was stored not necessarily just in the phone um, or at home, but in the cloud, and those data centres are really important. And so... Um, where there are critical projects, and my understanding in this state, so I'm now, I'm quite willingly, area. I have absolutely no expertise, but um, my understanding with state significant projects is that they get treated a little bit differently uh, to something that is in terms of a, uh, a development that might be in, in our outer suburbs or in an industrial park, something of significance um, will get treated differently and will be looked at with the wider economic context in mind. Um, if there are particular issues, I'll, I'll, I'm more than happy to take those on board outside of the, the Q&A session. Um, but one, I think we are going to see more of these centres come up. But increasingly, too, we're going to see an expectation from community that the way that the centres are run and the amount of energy that they use, that they improve energy efficiency as well. And that's a big challenge, I think, um, for the digital sector more broadly about much more efficient use. I might come back to the point that AI in some cases has optimised the operation of those data centres to use significantly less amounts um, of energy. Um, but there'll be other questions that come up on that. But to the substantive point you're raising about you know, getting those things right, if there are blockages in the system that impact on either state or national economies, let's get them out on the table and see what we need to do because if they're causing frustration, let's attend to it by all means. Yeah. We don't have much time, so that'll be very quick. There's a question here. There. I think he's saying that to me because I'm answering the questions too long. No, so. no, no, no. <laughs> Thank you, Minister. I think you made a brief reference to pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. It's quite scary that most of our pharmaceuticals come from overseas. I'm wondering if you've got any details about us manufacturing yeah. them almost solely here, which would be excellent. Well, I, uh, uh, again, um, I might do something you may not necessarily be accustomed from politicians, which is to answer directly. Um, uh, I, I don't think, can I be completely upfront, I don't think we will ever manufacture all medicines here uh, because there will be different skills and different um, capacities or capabilities in various parts of the world and we've got you know, an ability to move things around and get that, that happening. So I think that's really important that I, I say that to you up front. But I do, what I do share with you is the desire, absolutely, for us to increase what we manufacture here and to support those that are willing to do so. Um, I mentioned that firm Vaxis in Brisbane. I mean, they, you, you may all recall, when you got your COVID vaccine, remember they had to store them in super cold temperatures, right? Because the fragility of the mix was such, it needed to be stored that way. This firm, in Brisbane, made up of Australians, had worked out that instead of putting that vaccine in a needle um, and developing it, they can put it on a small patch of some of the tiniest, like half the size of a hair, human hair, prongs, that get put into a device no larger than a 20 cent piece that you press the back of and administers the vaccine, but can be stored in temperatures up to 40 degrees. Now, can you imagine us being able to have those vaccines, particularly for communities 
that find it hard to have the facilities, the cold storage facilities, develop that. This is know-how that was developed right here and is turning heads internationally and is being pursued by investors to offshore and they have not only said no, but they opened up their own facility in Brisbane in defiance of those investors to have deep roots right here in this country. Those are the type of things we do need to look at. So, um, for example, my colleague Mark Butler is looking at a review of the Medical Research Future Fund to make sure that some of the grants there that help in that commercialisation process are available. I was determined that we set up a $1.5 billion target fund within the National Reconstruction Fund to ensure the capital is available to manufacture uh, along the lines of which you strong, so strongly believe and that I think a lot of other Australians want. And it's also been fashioned, if I can say, by that experience that the things we needed at the time we needed the most weren't here and we do need to deal with that. And instead of just talking that talk at the time of the pandemic, we are determined to walk the walk post-pandemic, make this a reality and see what we can do and see in those key areas that we have attended to those shortfalls where we've been overly dependent on others to get those medicines. And we also manufacture some terrific, a whole range of different medicines here that we can export. And I think that's the other thing as well, meet our needs as a country, but help others in need too. Second last question. Thanks, Ed, for your uh, really personal story about your dad as mm. a welder and mm. the impact that industry policy has on families around the kitchen table. My question's around your fund, your $15 billion mm -hmm. fund. You spoke about Microsoft getting the initial funding for the data centre yep. piece from that. What about oh, no, small I... businesses yep. and medium businesses, given that many of the great stories of Australian manufacturing start as a small yep. or medium business? 100%. Um, how are you going to ensure that that fund goes to those businesses that employ, I think, roughly 70 to 80% yep. of people in the economy mm -hmm. and not the large big tech companies yep. that pay very little in tax in Australia. Um, just if you could comment on that, I'm really yeah, interested yeah. in that. So a number of things. One is, can I just stress, Microsoft have made a $5 billion investment of their own money. So we haven't given them money out of the National Reconstruction Fund. Um, but uh, we, we, are, we are likely to give a range of different companies um, support uh, that'll be made by that loans, equity and guarantee made by that board. Um, some of them will be a bit the small companies that want to make the leap from small to medium and potentially large. And there might be large firms that want to expand their footprint here, create more jobs and attend to some of the um, shortfalls that people have been asking me or raising as questions tonight about things we need to do more here on shore. So there'll be a range of, of different players or different sized firms that'll do that. And we are very conscious. Um, and, and something that I said earlier, uh, and I think it was in response to your question about we didn't want to see firms leave the country because they couldn't get the capital they needed to grow and, and survive. Um, some of those companies that find it really hard are SMEs. Um, and there could be a whole host of reasons for that. And they will need to come up with a business plan and they'll need to be able to demonstrate a rate of return. The expectation of chasing that capital will be just the same as for others. But if there is clearly a capacity, something that they are doing that builds manufacturing capability in those priority areas, then we, we would expect and we would hope that the fund would be there to see that type of expansion. So it'll be a range of different businesses. We don't want it to be just all chewed up by one end of the, the spectrum, as it were. We want to be able to see those firms grow. And I'm also making sure that for some of those small firms too, you know, giving them a loan or where they're at in their life cycle, giving them a loan or a guarantee or equity is too early for them because they're still early in the commercialisation process. So they, what they want is grants to be able to take them to the next step. So the industry growth program that I referenced in my remarks earlier is designed to provide that um, bridge um, from the technology readiness levels that normally it's referred to as the valley of death between four and, and seven. We want to be able to have that bridge over that and grants will play a role there. So that way, um, our approach is catered to the businesses at their particular point in the life cycle, and it's relevant to them then. Just a quick final question. Uh, if you come back in three years' time, and assuming you've won the next election, what would you Don't think would be the... Twitch. Don't <laughs> make my Twitch. What would be the major 
initiative you, you would you would look back on and hope to have achieved first of the various ones you've gone through tonight? First, I never tempt fate. So we'll go through the election and I'm a Labor politician who's gone through elections that were supposed to be a sure thing and they weren't. And so, and the reason I say that to you all is not because I'm a rabid pessimist, but rather I think it focuses on the need to deliver concretely. Um, and to your point, what I want to be able to see is that there's a path where we see um, a greater uh, complexity in our economic system, that we can sense that we're making some headway across those key areas. And the biggest thing that I've argued that we need to, uh, to see in terms of some of the things, be it from manufacturing medicines or helping emerging technologies uh, grow and thrive in this country and add value, but the biggest thing I want to see is to shake off this what has dogged us for generations, which is um, we're too small a country, we can't do it, which speaks to a lack of faith in our know-how. The biggest thing I want to challenge is that, that we, we do have the ability to get things done. We need to make sure the ingredients are there uh, to do so. And the reason I say it is not because it's a cute political point, but having faith in our know-how influences the way we make decisions, either as governments buying products off those firms, SMEs, for example, in a procurement context, or the investors that are going to make a decision about whether or not to back capability here, not just as governments, but broader investors in the community as well, because they go, yep, we, we've got to back this because we want to steal the march on someone else. And that while I think learning from overseas is important, we, I want people to learn from us. And we have a lot of smart people that are doing some really good things that will transform our economy and industry long term. And for me, if I can get a change in the political environment that increasingly says, why aren't we doing more of this here and why won't we back governments to do it? If we can get that dynamic in our public discourse, I think will be a good thing for us long term. Thank you. Well, there are a lot of people here and, uh, and we're right on time. So I just want to say thanks to Ed Husik for a, a great presentation tonight. It was great to hear about your own personal story and what, what you think we should be doing and also a view from the suburbs and sometimes the distant suburbs. So well done. I'd love to have you back sometime in the future, but well done tonight. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you.